Welcome everybody to breaking Enigma with the power of C++, of modern C++ even. So uh, I'm going to start with a very easy question. I think this is probably the easiest question I ever had in a talk. Who is this man? Everybody knows him. <laughs> I mean, I'm not taking a lot of risks. This, this is a talk that I'm doing to a bunch of computer scientists in England. So yeah, for those who failed to have the overview point, this is Alan Turing which, oh yeah, it's on the 50 pounds note, so you can't really miss that. Uh, and for those who don't know, this is the manor near Bletchley Park, that uh, was where uh, the cryptographic uh, uh, army units of, uh, of the British uh, Army was uh, uh, situated uh, in. That's not where they worked. Uh, they worked in something called huts, which looked like kind of hangars and, or like small uh, buildings that you can still visit. Today, I think some of them have been preserved. And that's where a lot of, uh, a lot of in intelligence, especially like code cracking, happened uh, during World War II. <clears throat> uh, if you've never been to England, oh, sorry, I just used that slide. I studied in Germany to do that presentation, so there's that. So Bletchley Park is about here, which is, I don't know, I don't know England, it's somewhere there. Uh, and that's the, the machine that was built in uh, Bletchley Park, which is called the bomb. Um, that, was, uh, that was used to, uh, to crack those German codes. Uh, it's sometimes referred as the first computer, which is technically incorrect. Uh, I think Wikipedia calls it like an electromechanical computing device or something. Because the big idea of a computer is that you can program it to do multiple things, right? It's kind of a, you can give it different tasks. And this one cannot be programmed outside of basically changing the, the order or the kind of code you're trying to match. But the only thing it can do is crack Enigma codes uh, given like some suspected inputs. That's the only thing it can do. You can't pre-program it to do your taxes or anything else. Uh, that would be later computers like, uh, like this one that Alan Turing also worked on later in his life. Uh, and that is the Enigma machine. This is the thing that's going to keep us busy for the next uh, hour and, uh, and a half. Uh, an interesting piece of German engineering. We'll get back to it. But before that, hello, I'm Matthew. Uh, I'm a tech lead at Paradox Interactive, or Paradox Development Studio, uh, where I make a game uh, called Hearts of Iron, which is set about in World War II. So this is kind of on point and on brand for, uh, for this talk. Uh, you can reach me as one of those very various uh, things. I never managed to match them, so it's just all different identifiers, but eh, there you go. Um, the, uh, there is several, there's an online version of this talk that you can already find. It's uh, better in the sense that Max, my cat, helped me do it from remote, so you have a free cat in uh, a few places. But this one is a special version for you because ACCU is an hour and a half and not an hour, contrary to most conference, so you will get some bonus slides at the end. So what are we going to talk about? Obviously, we're going to talk about cryptography. Uh, we're going to talk about how do you break ciphers. And I'm talking about historical ciphers, modern, modern ciphers. I'm not going to explain you how to break RSA or AES. That's, that's a different topic. Uh, we're going to talk about history because, I mean, it's me and I like history. I work on historical games, so you're going to get some history. And I promise there's even some code at some point. I'm not going to tell you when because I want to keep you on your seat. Just make sure you don't leave until you see the slides. There is some code, I promise. Cool. So how did I get the ID for this talk, actually? Um, so. This is my game director, uh, Ari Rowe, I think he's, no, his real name is Peter. Uh, he was trying to make a, like a small like, teaser for an expansion coming up for our, for our game. And he said, hey, here's the thing. We got this code that we captured from people. And then he gave like those, uh, those things at the end. So if you know anything about uh, the Enigma machine, you have a bunch of rotors in it. And one of the things you need to know to crack the code is which rotor are being used in which order. So when they say one, six, four, it means that the, first, the, the three rotors installed in the machine are number one, number six, and number four. And then Victor Free is just some help that basically gives you the idea of what, are you, what, what it's called a crib. It's basically a, a section that you know is in the message that helps you figure out what the, what, how to decode the message. Uh, and I had a small talk with him and the, and the marketing team after that. I was like, but you gave them everything, right? Like, you gave them the, you give them the rotor order, you give them some, uh, some information. Like, surely a cipher that was invented in the 1920s you don't need to give them that, right? Make them work for the teaser, right? Like, a thing that has been invented, like, what is it, like 80 years ago at this point? There's no way they can't crack that in a matter of seconds in a modern computer. Or can they? Like, that, that's, that's the obvious thing, right? You're like, ah, electro electromechanical, like, uh, device with a bunch of wires from the 20s. No way it can measure up for a modern computer. But actually, it's just a guess. I have no idea. I had no idea. Now I know. And maybe in an hour and a half, you will know. Can it be done? Basically, this talk is like, who would win, right? Like two nerds with a bunch of math de degrees and some papers, or like a lot of cores and me, who is really bad at math, but I have a CPU that Turing could not even dream about. So let's see. But first, I need to explain you some German space magic and how is the Enigma machine made. 
So uh, let's get to some uh, basis. So you know, uh, a very tired quote from Sun Tzu, all warfare is based on deception. So if you've never been a military uh, scientist or anything like that, I, have to, I happen to work with a lot of armchair generals, so I can give you a very quick primer on how that works. So bigger number usually wins in warfare. Like I, I, we had players complain about that several times. We had to close a bunch of JRS because we're like, oh, I don't understand. I attack this guy with less numbers and I lose. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. So sometimes you don't have the biggest number. So what you do is you try to attack the enemy where they don't expect you and you achieve what we call local superiority, right? And the thing that we discovered in the early 20th century is that radio helps a lot. A big reason why people ask, like, but why didn't they do like a lot of guerrilla tactics in the, uh, in the 1800s and, and 1700s? Like, why didn't they do the Blitzkrieg? And one of the reasons is like, well, they just got lost in the woods. Because without radios, you're just a bunch of guys walking through the woods and you get really, really quickly lost. And then you get swept out by a big army in marching order because they can't see each other through the trail of smoke. Uh, but radio changed that. And with radio, you can start coordinating a lot of small units and do very more complex maneuvers. But there's a catch. You know, radio is not really hard, right? It's just a bunch of, uh, of, of things you set over, over, the, over, over, the, over the waves. If someone knows the frequency, and that's not too hard to find, then they can listen to you, and then they can just wait exactly where you're going. They know exactly what you're doing. And again, warfare is based on deception. If they know where you're going, you're probably going to lose. Uh, and that's true for most of history uh, in terms of warfare. So how do you prevent the enemy from uh, listening to you? We, we, you probably have heard of the Caesar cipher, right? Where uh, uh, famously Caesar enciphered uh, all his, uh, his thing by doing like a, a one-letter rotation on, uh, on, on all the alphabets. This is a, a bit more advanced version of it. So in the late 19, it's really hard to find sources, but somewhere between the late World War I and, and, and the interwar period, uh, a, a German uh, engineer invented this, uh, this, this device that he tried to sell to commercial companies. They said, oh, you, you're probably exchanging like uh, company trade secrets over telegraph, and people could like bribe the telegrapher to basically get the data on your patents and stuff like that, or just maybe like information about your financial situation. You don't want that to happen. So how about you can uh, encrypt your, your financial and company data over telegraphs you send, and, and, and then you would be created. It didn't get a lot of uh, traction, but he found somebody else who was really interested, and that's, that's the German army, or the Wehrmacht at the time. Uh, because here's the thing about the Enigma machine. It's self-powered, it's portable, like I unfortunately do not own one, but for the purpose of the demo, it could, it basically the size of the laptop if, you, if it was a box instead of a thing that flips. It's not that big. It has like a very small like power battery, like a modern one can be powered by a nine volt battery that you would put in anything, even like this clicker or something. Uh, so, you know, if you have an armored command vehicle or a submarine, each, each command vehicle can have one of those, and it enciphers like, uh, most, uh, like letters, so it's perfect for Morse, which is usually one of the things you send over the, over the air rather than actual like radio talk, because that gets garbled, etc., etc. And that's how uh, the German army, especially in the, the 30s and 40s, figured out you could coordinate a large amount of people without being listening to. It's, it's a game changer. Uh, so how does that work? That's, that's the interesting bit, right? Because at the end of the day, there's no electronics in this, right? We were talking about like 1920s tech. Uh, it's powered by a very small battery, and it's just a bunch of wires and rotors. So you have a rotor, like this one. Uh, we also call them wheels, kind of interchangeable terms. But uh, basically, it has 26 pins on one side and 26 pins on the other side. And there is, originally, there was like a bunch, uh, there was like uh, three different, uh, four different rotors. No, three different rotors. And after, uh, as the war progressed, they added more rotors to add more complexity. And in the end, there's 10 of them, 10 different models. How are they different? The wiring inside them is different. Basically, each one of them is a simple substitution cipher, right? Like. Uh, Every letter maps to a different letter. That's just that's that's what the wires do, right? You, you take like an A here, and maybe in this one it's gonna come out in a C, but in the in another wheel it's come, gonna come up as a as an F, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's static, right? Once they once they've been like pressed in the factory, it's they're not gonna change. They're always the same. So by itself, it's not very complex. It's just a simple like substitution cipher. You get a current N with a letter, and then another letter comes out. That's not very complex. But then what gets interesting, and you can chain them. Because again, it's contacts on both sides. So you chain them one by one, and so it goes through the first one, and then the A becomes an E, and then it goes to the E pin of the next one, and then it becomes a V, for example. And then that V pin becomes like a Y, or something like that. <clears throat> and on top of that, since they're rotors, they can rotate, as the name implies. So the good thing is that you can put them on, a, like on an axle like this, and every time someone types on a keyboard, you just turn the wheel one, uh, one notch. 
which means it reconfigures the pens. And the next time you type a letter, it will not be encoded the same way, because obviously the pathways have changed, because you turn once. And then whatever, what you do is that every full rotation of the one on the left, the one in the middle turns, et cetera, et cetera. And that way, uh, it's not just a simple substitution cipher, because I mean, you can prove mathematically that if the wheels never turn, then you can have one, two, or 20 wheels. It's the exact same amount. It's, it, at, at the end, you have one substitution cipher. But if the wheel turns every time, then the cipher changes every keystroke. And then you start like being immune to classic old school attacks to look like for repeating patterns and things like that. So it's pretty smart for what it does. Uh, but it doesn't come with a printer. Uh, I have an asterisk because actually there is an accessory that was sold separately that allowed you to print. But, uh, but the original Enigma does not have a printer because it's trying to be very small. Instead, there is like a reflector, uh, basically a stator that is at the end of the, of the, of the succession of rotors. And it, all, all it does is that it takes uh, your, your the current from like one of the pins and it bounces it back uh, the other way. And so the current will traverse back through the pins all the other way around and comes up on the left side again. And then the only thing you do is that you pick the current, like basically you, you put like a, a current through, through one of the pins, and then on the second keyboard that is on top of your first keyboard, I don't know if I have another, uh, uh, no, I don't have any, uh, the picture of the Enigma. But you have your keyboard, and on top of that you have another set of all your letters with lamps. And basically every time you type, every time you type one key, and it's a pretty strong press because you have to depreciate the, the mechanism and make the wheel run, <coughs> The contacts will just align, and only one pin will get current uh, on the other side, and so one of the lamps will light up, and I will tell you which letter you get out. And basically, usually you had an assistant who would just write down as you type the result, and then they would just telegraph that to, uh, to whoever does it. The other advantage is that it makes it re reflexive. If someone gives you like an enigma, an enigma uh, enco uh, encoded text, if you reset back the machine to the original setting and type exactly what you got, since it's reflective, you get the message back. So you get uh, encryption and, and decryption with the same mechanism, and that simplifies a lot of operating procedures and avoid mistakes. So that's, that's good. So when it started, it was three orders that you can technically put in any order. So you know, uh, first one you have three options, second one two, third one one. I'm bad at math, but that's six. Trust me on that one. Uh, then it gets a bit uh, more shifty. But then you have 26, uh, you have 26 row order position uh, initially because you can put like, uh, when, you, when you start typing your message, every word can dis dis is displaying like one letter, A, B, C, D, et cetera. So you have technically 26 and 26 and 26 possible positions, so that's 17,000, blah, blah, blah. So if you multiply those two together, that's 100,000 combination. That's already probably too big to crack by hand, but that's still like, that's, those are rookie numbers, right? Like, uh, I wouldn't be uh, surprised that a modern computer can break it. I'm pretty sure some mathematician back in the time could have cracked it that easily too. So not bad, but we need to get better. Uh, the German army fought the same, so they made some revisions to it. Uh, one of the first things they did is that every word has a ring setting, which allows you to change when the next wheel will be turned by, the, by, the, by this one making a full revolution. So that way, uh, it's not predictable uh, by, by whoever is trying to read you when the turn happens, so that basically gives another uh, 20, uh, 26 by 26 uh, uh, position that the, the person trying to intercept you has to know to figure out the solution. But that was not enough. So they added another substitution cipher on top, uh, which were called the plug boards or stackers, from the German words, don't, don't ask me, I don't speak German. Uh, but basically what it does is that it just, uh, you plug a bunch of wires on the front of your, uh, of your Enigma machine, and it will just remap keystrokes uh, to a different letters. So, and you, you're supposed to plug, originally you, you had to plug six pairs together as part of the, of the process to set it up. In, later in the war, it was 10. And basically, if you type an A, the machine would think you type an E, and then the letter will light up, would translate back, if you got an E, it would translate it back like an A. So that's basically, you multiply this by a combinatory uh, of, the, of that thing. So if we, if we do some, uh, some math, no, wait, first, they also added more warriors because they were also worried that that was not enough combination. So originally there was not enough rotors, they added more rotors, and then they said, you know what? What we need to do is have a fourth rotor. Instead of just like more combination, what if we had a fourth rotor? But again, they wanted to retrofit it in existing machines. They didn't want to uh, create new machines with different size, formats, and everything. Again, reuse and, uh, and refactoring. So they created a new series of uh, rotors that would basically half the size of a normal rotor. And then you, put, you, could put, uh, you could put one, and then you had a thinner reflector, 
And that way, instead of the third wheel and the reflector, uh, sorry, instead of the reflector, you had a fourth wheel and a smaller reflector. And that way, they managed to retrofit four wheel into the machine that was designed with three originally. And that's the one they use, for example, with the Kriegsmarine, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the Navy, and especially the U-boats, the, the submarines. <clears throat> and that way, if we do the math for real, that we have four waters out of 10, uh, the reason it's like that is because there is only so many that of the, the slim rotors only have two models. So you have two times eight times seven times six. So that's, that's seven, uh, six, seven, uh, six, seven, two. You still have your initial uh, water position, but this time it's, uh, it's four instead of uh, three. So that's, that's another uh, 26 times. Uh, then you have the ring settings. Uh, the reason why it's only so many ring settings is, of course, the, the leftmost water does not have a next water to make turn. So it doesn't matter which ring setting you put on it. It's never going to apply to anything, so you can only you only care about the free uh, the free on the left uh, the, 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 the the free on the right. And finally, you have uh, ten possibilities. It, uh, you you plug you make ten pairs out of twenty six letters. I'm really bad at math, but it's some factorial stuff, and I'm told it's about that number, which you know, looks pretty big to me. Uh, and if you multiply all that together, that's about uh, yeah. 10 to the power of like 27 or something like that, roughly speaking. So like close, closely, close to about 62 bits of encryption, which again, it's a bunch of wheels, uh, rotors, some wires, uh, cables, and, and a lamp, and you get 62 bits encryption. That's pretty good. As for a tech that is like 70 year old now, if you consider the latest revision, I can see why people thought that it wasn't crackable at the time. So how do you set it up? Uh, basically, every party in that is supposed to be in the know has a, has, a, has a sheet book which tells them like what's the daily setup. And the daily setup is like, uh, in what order do you put the rotors? Originally, they change it monthly. Later, they change it more often because they were afraid that someone might be able over time to see enough traffic to crack it. Uh, then you set the ring settings to decide when all the rotors are actually going to turn. They don't always turn on the A. Sometimes they turn on the B or on the Z. You can configure that. And then you set up the plug board, you close the machine, and then you start actually typing your message. Um, if they quickly realize that if uh, you use the same key to encipher all message during the day, then people have a lot of text that they can try to correlate, and that's bad, obviously. So they do exactly what you do in modern cryptography. They have a very small, uh, they, 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 they actually use the, the daily key, they only use it to encrypt a, different, a key that is basically four letters wide. And then they re-encrypt the message using that special key. And it's the same thing if you ever looked at modern crypto, like uh, RSA and other things like that. That's the same idea. You use the very heavyweight crypto to encode a very small message, and then you can use something a bit less uh, expensive later on, because that thing changes every time, and it, it doesn't matter. Like, people cannot do frequency analysis and stuff like that. So yeah, basically, you pick a, you pick a key at random, you type your message with it, uh, and then you encode the, that key as a preamble to the message with the actual official key that you had pre-agreed uh, with, uh, with the other person. And then you type the message, blah, 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 and you append the key. <clears throat> cool. So how did they crack it? Because if you look at the setup, that's like, OK, they had 62 bits encryption, and what they had is like math and a bunch of pencils. Like, how do you crack that? I wouldn't know where to start. So um, actually, this is where I have to take a small uh, jab at Turing, because people think Turing cracked Enigma. It's absolutely wrong. Uh, the Poles cracked Enigma. And then Turing came in. So let's, let's do some history. So it's 1930s, and the Pol Poland, Poland's know that the Germans are up to no good. Uh, and they realize quickly that they need to ramp up uh, their, their war effort to be able to maybe prevent what's to come, or at least get an idea of what's happening. And Poland had some issues in the 30s, but the thing they were good at is math. Uh, so we heard this man, uh, fresh out of uni, I think he just had his master's degree, or maybe he finished it while he was hired by the government. Uh, his name is uh, Maciej uh, Rajewski. Uh, he was born in 1905, he died in the, he died in the early 80s. Uh, and alone, with a few assistants, he managed to reverse engineer uh, all the Enigma machine by, based on sales documentation that they could find on the German market. They just sent some people over to just like say, hey, we're interested in buying the commercial Enigma. And they just got like uh, documentation from like you know sales uh, sales tracts, and the sales tracts has some excerpts of like this is the encoded text, this is the result, and based on that and an ID and the help of the French, I think, who gave them like a machine without the rotors, but just an idea of how it works, he managed to break, to reverse engineer the math to figure out how the rotors were configured. I have no idea. Who he did. And then he designed something called the Bomba, and if you just 
somewhat good at linguistic, you realize it's very close to the British bomb. There's a reason why, right? because that's where it came from. And then they shared all their findings in, uh, in July 1939 when they knew that the, the war was basically about to happen. So well, that's the bomba. That's the original one that the Poles built. Uh, because they figured out something very quickly. Uh, there's a problem when you send an Enigma message to someone is that the message key, which was three orders at the time, is only three letters at the beginning of your telegram, right? And if your operator makes a mistake or like uh, hears the wrong like beep beep or something like that, you get the wrong letter. And guess what? If you get one letter off, you can't read the text. It's garbage. So what they did is that they repeated it twice to give a chance to the radio operator to correct if you get like a garbled transcri uh, transcription. But then that gives the polls and anyone who tracks to crack it something very interesting. They know that the first and the fourth character in the, in the text have to be the same, unless, like, the, the, uh, unless the operator made a mistake. But on most messages, those two characters are the same, those two characters are the same, those two characters are the same. So they built a machine that said, OK, for those combination of rotors, try every key until you, you reach that property. And then you found the key. And since there is like six possible water orders at the time, because there was like three orders, if you just built six of it that were wired in the sense of the, uh, of the that were especially, especially wired for the three orders orders, and they just had it run over day. And the thing would stop when that property was matched with like a very simple electric check, like all those two pins connected at the end, yes or no, done. Uh, that worked pretty well. Uh, for most of the 30s, they could read all the uh, German traffic and send it over to the Allies. The Germans had no idea. They were clueless for the entire world. I'll go back to that later. But they had no idea that it was possible. And the Poles shared that with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, with the Allies for the longest time. The trick stopped in May 1914, uh, which, if you know history, you know is when the uh, Germans started turning west in its, uh, in its, uh, in its aggression. Uh, they realized that repeating the message key at, at the start was probably a bit risky. So they stopped doing that, and they said, ah, we'll, we'll, we'll accept transcription errors as a, as, as, a, as, a, as, as a potential problem rather than having the repetition that it make, might make it too easy to crack. So they started trying to find another way to find like basically redundancy in the messages or something to find a way for the same concept of machine to stop. And the big thing that Turing did at the time with uh, the help of a few of our engineers at Bletchley was take the bomba and make it programmable. So instead of just looking for like character one and three, uh, no, one and four, two and, uh, two and four, and, uh, and, 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 and three and six being the same, be able to match a bit more arbitrary sequences. And then we started looking at a lot of messages and say, hey, what are the words that people keep using in their messages? Try to match them at position. Have the machine stop when it finds a potential like uh, match. And then people will just finish the description, on, the description on paper to try to figure that out. Basically, the idea of the whole machine was filter out the whole search space to give our cryptographers like the one that are likely candidates. So how did they do that? Um, well, sorry, first. How did they, what, the, what are the results? Well, I mean, as you probably learned into his, in history, uh, they could read most of the German cipher from most of the war. Uh, and decryption usually took a couple of days at worst. Uh, because once you got a message, all you need to do is crack the, the daily key that is at the start, and then you can read the rest of the traffic. That's the, that's the big idea. And that's the funny thing. Germany, several times during the war, especially the, 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 uh, the, the intelligence service of Germany, of the German Reich, uh, was afraid that maybe uh, the, the, the Allies weren't to something. You know, sometimes they got too many submarines caught in a weird coincidence, or like trap, things like that. They're like, can they read us? They ordered several internal investigations. And after the war, the, uh, the Allied interrogated the, the, the remaining prisoners of war they got. And they were all convinced at the end that it was theoretically breakable, but probably cost prohibitive. So they were still, every report concluded that no, Enigma was safe. It was just bad coincidence, bad luck. The Allies just happened to be waiting for them at that exact moment. Happens. Right. That brings us to today, right? Because they did that with what we would consider today very primitive tech. We have something a bit more uh, powerful here. And I'm not talking about my laptop. It has four cores. But uh, the slides and the, the test I made, I run in on my home machine, who has 16. And then I got a new computer at work with a 12th gen with 20 cores. Um, let's see what we can do. Uh, but first, <laughs> some history. 
Come on, I'm not done yet. Um, so we need a data set, right? We need, we need a message to try cracking. Uh, and as much as I would like to try to attack like uncracked message forever, I'm not good enough at that. So I'm going to go with a famous message that has been cracked historically, but later in the story. So uh, this, is a, this is a U boat, uh, number 534. It was sunk off, uh, off the coast of Norway just before the end of the war. If you uh, know anything about history, that's three days before the end of World War II and the surrender of Germany. Um, it was discovered by, uh, by, uh, by a Norwegian and English team, I think, in 1986. It has been raised in 1993. I think, you can, I think it's in Scotland right now. Uh, and inside, they, thought, uh, they, they found 50 messages that had been relayed through Telegraph uh, that had been written, but like in, 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 uh, in, in, in crypto, in, in, crypto, in ciphertext, not in plain text, but no keys. Because again, Germans were not stupid. They knew that if a German U-boat is sunk, people would try to raise it to possibly get the key book. So all the key book were printed with water soluble ink. So if there is a breach and water gets into ink, the code book is unreadable. So uh, someone in the 2012 got a lot of time on their hand and decided to try to crack them using modern computers. Uh, and they started a thing called Enigma at Home, which if you don't know, uh, back in the early 2000s and early 2010s, uh, there was this whole thing like uh, something at home where you could like put your computer in a, in a farm and it would compute stuff. It was like Bitcoin, but useful. Uh, <clears throat> so you, you could actually use CPU power for something actually interesting. Uh, so he made Enigma at home, which was just like, okay, everybody can jump on the farm, run a, a thing on the computer. And with that, he cracked a bunch of things. But again, this was 2012. Like, you know, we know what happened. Like, remember what we could do in 2012? That's 11 years ago. Like, do CPUs are a joke nowadays. Can we do better? So uh, we're going to focus on one message. Uh, one, because it's a bit long, and I want to give myself a, a breather, because the longer the message, usually the easier it is. Uh, it was already cracked about, well, at the time when I, I made this talk, literally 10 years before, so I thought it was a good time. And also the message itself is interesting. So this is the actual cipher text of it. So that's what the, the, the radio operator received. That's garbage, right? Uh, here's the description. It also looks like garbage, but actually it's German. And I know at first you can't tell the difference, but if you start looking a bit closer, you have the words like Reichsmarkel, Goering, Führer, Admiral, Reich, Bormann. You're like, uh, it might be actual German, especially 1940s German. So uh, it's actually sent uh, early May 1944, and it announced that uh, the, the overall command of the Reich has been passed over to uh, Admiral Donitz, who was the head of the Navy at the time. It's significant for its time because uh, it basically they're running out of Nazis to put in charge of the Reich and they're down to like, the leader of the, of the Navy because that's the last one they could find in, uh, in May 1945. He would surrender three days later. That's him uh, being escorted by uh, British uh, officers as he's been arrested and surrendered. All right. Now let's get cracking for real. So some numbers first, okay? So I'm bad at math, but I know that 62 bits by brute force is probably not going to be good. Uh, I looked a bit on uh, like what's modern 62-bit brute force. That's the equivalent of finding like a, a SHA-1 collision with the best uh, collision that actual serious cryptographers have found since. And I'm pretty sure my computer cannot generate a, 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 a voluntary SHA-1 collision today. So okay, we're gonna need to be better. Let's try without the plug board. Okay, let's 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 get things simple. Let's ignore the plug board for now. We'll we'll go back to it later. That's still five trillion combinations. I. I'm not good at numbers, but five trillion seems like it's still a big number. Uh, I, I need like several uh, several bits to 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 like. Okay, what if we ignore the leftmost uh, router turnover? Like, what if we ignore the setting of the of the left mode router? Because you know you have uh, four routers in, in in a row. If the second one turns at 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 some point in the in 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 in, in that uh, in that one sequence, it will make the the leftmost one turn. But the thing is. The first one uh, turns every type, right? The second one turns every 26. The third one uh, turns every 26 times 26. The fourth one turns every 26 times 26 to 26. Most messages are shorter than that. So the left will, uh, the leftmost water will never change. Or at best, it will change once, and the rest of the message will be absolutely readable, and I can just tweak that later in post-processing. So let's just ignore it, and then we get back to 208 billions. I'm not good at numbers, but that sounds like a number maybe I can start attacking. So let's go with that. So okay, let's just to, let's go simple, right? We have every water permutation possible, like uh, four uh, i from zero to two, well, uh, one to two, then one to eight, then one to uh, seven, blah, blah, blah. 
For every ring setting, go 26 times 26, try every possible key, see if we match the text. Very simple. All right, let's go. Uh, that's an amount. Yeah, 238 billion, okay, so I, I, I have an ETA. It's, it doesn't look good. Like at, at 3,000 minutes, that's a, I mean, I guess if I wait a couple of days, it might be done, but I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. Uh, you know, and we know from my talk yesterday that man is mortal and doesn't have time for this stuff. So, uh, no, let's try to do better. Like, it's going to take maybe 52 hours. It's doable, but... Well, let's look at the code first. All right. So, how do we, how do we simulate an Enigma machine? It's actually quite simple. Uh, we simulate the fact that we're going through the plug board, right? So uh, we take the, uh, the input key, which is like a letter. We subtract A because my encodings are basically in a offset from 0 to 25. Uh, then we take the, uh, the third border, uh, the, 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 uh, the rightmost border. We go for the wiring. We, pick the, we have a lookup table. What, what does that pin go uh, lead to? And then we do the same thing, and then we do the same thing, and then we do the same thing to go through all the routers. Uh, and then we reach the reflector, so we bounce back, and then we continue. We just go in reverse in every order, so we have a reverse lookup table for every order, depending if you come from the left or the right, because we don't want to do like a linear search to find which one is matching. That's just really inefficient. Uh, we go through uh, the entry wheel, which is just a, a technical detail of the Enigma machine, and then we go through the plug board again, and we got our letter. That's basically the loop. What can we tell about this loop? Well, the first bit is like, the first thing we figure, oh, can we use CMD? We can't, because as you might realize, every input depends on the, uh, every output de input depends on the output of the rotor before it. CMD is all about doing simultaneous thing at the same time. We can't do that here. We could potentially try to run like four or eight Enigma keys at the same time, H1 in the CMD register, but it, let's, let's keep that for later. Let's go simple and say, can we optimize this better? So, uh, well, the first thing we have to do is that uh, we're going to make sure that we're going to generate like the forward and the reverse wi wiring for every character. Uh, and then we're going to repeat it three times. And we're going to do that at compile time because I want to do some constexper. Uh, and why are we doing it? Because of the module. Let me explain. So, this is, this is one of the, of the wheels. I think it's the first one. So that's the mapping of, uh, of, uh, of your Enigma wheel, right? You get, you get a current come up, and that's the later that comes out. And it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Cool. So, you know, and every time I type, it moves, right? So uh, that, 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 if I type, one letter, two letters, that the mapping changes every time, right? So that sounds like an easy thing to do, right? It's just like, okay, you take the wiring, you take the, uh, you take the input uh, value, and you add the offset, like, where is the actual, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a circle buffer. Uh, and yeah, that looks okay, right? You just you have to do a modulo, of course, because if you don't do a modulo, uh, you know, at some point you're gonna run out of the of the thing. If you're uh, if if you if you have turned like 24 times and someone inputs a Z, you don't want to go out of the way. You have to do a modulo. But computers are really bad at modulos, even static modulos, even like if you can tell client, please, it's 26. Is there? For some of them, they have a very smart guy who had made a very smart formula that allows you to transform them into like two multiplication, two, two subtraction and an add, and sometimes a multiply. It's still bad. Uh, here's, here's the bit, right? If, if, see, I told you there was some code. There's even some assembly. Look at, look at how neat we're going. So this is, the, this is what it does, right? So we, uh, we move the... We move the value from the, from the register, we do a multiplication. It's, it's basically, that thing is a modulo in disguise because Clang or MSVC figured out that multiply by that weird number and then doing some shift is actually faster than doing a modulo. Don't ask me how, but it does. <clears throat> uh, and then we just, get the, uh, we, just, we just get the actual address uh, doing that index and we get the letter out. Cool. What if we're smarter? What if we take the, what if we take a wheel and duplicate it like one time before and one time after, and then we add 26 to the value? What happens then? Well, it doesn't matter where we fall. We will always fall at worst up to 26 characters later or up to minus 26 characters before. So we will still find into reasonable space. We will still like jump into an actual address. And basically we just make the, uh, the, the rudder repeats itself each, uh, three times. And since this value is between 0 and 26. This one is between 0 and... Uh, wait, what? Uh, yeah, I think it's... No, it, it could be minus 26 to plus 26. And then we have 26. We always guarantee that we fall under that thing. And then we don't have a modulo. We just have a lookup on a slightly bigger table. And if you look at the code that is generated, that looks like this instead. 
And if you look at it, it's very similar. It's the same one, but instead of doing a very costly modulo, I just had 26 to this. Oh, and by the way, I did some experiments. Um, modern computers, uh, if you have a tight bit of assembly, uh, adding a register or adding a register plus a constant is the same amount of time. The CPU doesn't matter, doesn't care. Like, it's basically by default, it just adds zero, but if you add any other constants, it's the same. For example, you'll notice that a lot of my code is using actual like ASCII letters in the, in the intermediate variable value. I tried to remove them, thinking that I would gain something. I gained nothing, except it was harder to debug, because I had to remember that 17 is what letter already? You see, I can't do it on top of my head, but I can tell you that it's a P, if it's actually ASCII P character. So that just helped debugging, and I lost no, uh, no, no, I, I lost zero, uh, zero processing and computing time. So that was cool. <laughs> okay, but let's go back to trying to improve our code. Threads, right? It's cool, we have them. I mentioned before that I had 16 threads on my machine, now 20. So let's see. If we have 16 cores, uh, it should take us like 57 hours divided by 16. That's about three and a half hours. And we have C17 now, so you know, you can just take your for loop and just add like par, par, uh, 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 and sec, and, and then you're done. So, you know, we, uh, we generate an, an array of like 26 values. I think I, I did that for, uh, I think I did that for like the first key, for example. Uh, you generate an array of like 26 values, uh, and then you just do a for each. And the only thing you do on your, uh, on your thing is like, for example, like I want to try the right wing set, uh, the right wing setting on, 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 on 16 threads instead of one. All I do is that instead of doing a for like one to 26, I do a for each with a pre-generated sequence of uh, 26 uh, numbers, and I just add like power and sec in the execution framework. And on Windows, that was good enough. Uh, whatever MSCVC does is perfect for me. It, it's, it basically creates like one, uh, one worker thread per, uh, per core, and I get perfect parallelization. Done. And if you run the thing, it's actually like, I don't have a screenshot for there, but it's basically, it lined up exactly that. So like, basically, a 20, uh, one, one sixteenth of the time because I had 16 cores trying to crack the thing, uh, trying different combinations instead of one. That was probably the most trivial change I had to go from one to 16 cores. But maybe now we can try to attack the algorithm again. Because here's the thing. We know the first row is probably never going to move because it, like the, it, it, it cycle is 26 and 26 and 26. But what about the second one? It's 26 and 26. I'm not good at math, but that's over 600. Most messages are like, 300 characters long. Again, at best, it's going to turn once. So, you know, actually, uh, the Germans realized that that might be a problem. So they made some words that can turn every 13 instead of turning every 26. But even on the best case scenario, which means they have two fast words on the right, it's still 169 keystrokes uh, before I get to turn. Uh, and and if, if I'm lucky and they use the slow words, it's never going to turn during my, uh, my, my cracking attempt. So they, I'm not even going to see it. So what's the conclusion? Just assume that the third rotor is always set to zero in terms of, uh, of ring settings, and then try to match at least one quarter of the message. And if I get at least one quarter of the message correct, well, I know that I'm close. I just need to fix the, the moment when the rotor turns, and I'll get the rest of the decryption ungarbled easy. And then we can fine tune the ring setting afterward, because it's just trying 26 combination until finding out the one that works. That is on a separate step, so that's easy. Uh, so basically, that's what we do, right? We, we only do, instead of uh, 26 times 26 times 26, we just do 26 times 26 until we find a partial match. Uh, and that reduces the search space to 4 billions. Uh, and that's, eh, six minutes. Pretty good. But um, I cheated, right? I just. Simplify the thing by removing the I don't know how many trillion combination that the, the deploy board had. So, yeah, yay me, I cheated. Okay, so how do we break the deploy board? So there's about 150,000, uh, 150 trillion uh, possible setups for the deploy board, right? That's a lot. Again, when we're talking about exhaustion, we figured out before that if I go to 8 billions, it's a matter of minutes. Uh, 150 trillions is way more than 8 billions. That's, that's about the order of magnitude I can understand in math. So brute force is not going to work. We're going to have to be smarter. Can we split the problem? Is there a way that maybe there is an in, those, those, those two properties are not actually entirely independent from each other, which means I can attack them in two passes? And as it turned out, there is. Because remember, there's 24 keys on the plug board. 
but they don't plug all the plugs. The German operating procedure is plug 10. There's some math behind it that says it's actually better than plugging all of them. I'm not smart enough to understand it. But here's the thing. Six letters will come out correct even if my plug board is empty. Because six, six letters are, un are unplugged, regardless of the configuration. So what if I brute force with an empty combination? And then I looked at the matches, and I get the top six. And with some heuristic, I should be able to tell the ones that are correct and the ones that are just random chance. So this is the actual uh, uh, pairs that uh, were used that day for the message we're trying to crack. So A and E are together, B and F are together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what the decrypt does if I actually do it with an empty plug board. The red are wrong, like it's not actually supposed to be a B. Uh, the, the letter count is wrong. Yeah, that's not the right letter that comes out. The green ones are the correct ones. Uh, and the blue ones are the bigger ones. And if you look at it, you'll notice that the O is correct because the O is, uh, is unstuck. Uh, the I is correct and the G is correct because, again, those letters are not matched. So if I look at my top six, I will get four A's. This is wrong. I will get uh, six E's. This is also wrong. But also get four, five, six, and then four. That sounds like um, half of my score is wrong, but that's actually good enough. That is actually good enough. I tweak the heuristic a bit. And basically, if you get about one-tenth of the length correct uh, by just counting, like, what's the number of, uh, what's your top six letters that are actually correct, you get the right one. <clears throat> and that way, basically, what you do is that you break the rotor order, you break the ring settings, you break the key, and then you know that you have six letters correct on the plug board, and all you have to do is try out with some hill climbing algorithm or, like, some like a space exploration algorithm um, that there's a bunch of that are already pre-made. I did not bother rewriting one because that gets into optimization, math optimization problems. But we know this is a search space problem, right? Where you try to go to, you, you, you try something. If it doesn't work, you try going another way. It's, it's just like a, a dimensional exploration thing that I probably studied in school but forgot about. Uh, but trust me on this, it's called hill climbing. It works pretty well, actually. So. What if we ignore all the ring settings? Let's, let's go crazy. Let's say, you know what? Even the rightmost brother. What if, what if it's wrong? You know, like, the turnover will be wrong, right? So every uh, 25 to, uh, to 36, uh, 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 yeah, every 20, uh, 26 to 13 uh, strokes, I will, get, I, I will be wrong for a while because I turn too early or too late. But then I will catch up. I will get correct uh, output again, and then it will repeat itself like uh, or along the message in kind of a predictable uh, at a predictable rate. Is it enough? And as it turns out, it usually leaves enough fragments to be able to distinguish from noise because you had the wrong settings, and that means then you only need to uh, fine tune the ring settings which you can do in one pass, that is 26 by 26 to 26 if you really want to be exhaustive. And again, usually you can ignore that one because it's not going to move. And so we start the thing, and okay, you see I'm very good at ATAs. I have learned from Microsoft. Uh, and there we go. We got it. It's uh, five, uh, 9568, which is just uh, technically uh, 9 and 10 are like uh, the beta and gamma wheels, and then it's uh, number 568. The settings are 0, 0, 7, yeah, and the key is Y, O, F, Z. And done. It worked. So some last thoughts or so. So I didn't do the math, all right? So the heuristic might not work with all the messages because, again, this is, uh, this is a side project I had for fun. Maybe I got lucky. Uh, shorter messages, you might not be able to distinguish from the garbage. Uh, you might need to reintroduce, like, at least trying 26 times more, like, uh, ring settings or something like that to be able to distinguish lucky, uh, lucky randoms from, from actual real data. Um, some people have talked about index of coincidence. Can it work better? Uh, and some theorists will come at me and say, this is not a ciphertext only cracking. Uh, this, is, this is cheating. You actually know the output. You're just trying to match it. That's not what real cryptographers do. Real cryptographers, they have nothing. They just try to crack a text, they have no idea what it is. Uh, that's where I was when I made this talk originally, but this is ACCU, so uh, it's time for bonus content. 
All right. So, how do we make a C++ bomb in 2023? Because again, we uh, we don't want to attack this brute force. I'm not gonna go with uh, I'm not gonna go with uh, ciphertext only first. I'm just gonna say, hey, can we try to replicate what they did at Bletchley? Because right now I'm just basing myself on the fact that I know all the all the ciphertext. But obviously, they did not know all the ciphertext at Bletchley. They were lucky once or twice. Uh, I didn't delve into it, but I guess I'm going to explain it a bit. How did they figure out how to get an idea of what the message is? There are several ways. A classic is they have a broadcast announcement to the whole like, German uh, armies that they usually send in plain text. But then for submarines, for example, they will still encrypt it because they don't want to reveal something. And that way, you can try to say, hey, there was a big announcement to everybody today. Try the messages who have the same length or similar length that have been sent to subs today. Maybe it's the same one. And you can also uh, rely on uh, operator errors. For example, uh, I, I, Irvin Rommel, the famous general who fought in North Africa and later in, uh, in, in, early in the Battle of France, he had a very pompous Prussian uh, aide of uh, uh, chief of uh, aide, de, aide de camp, uh, like um, a second in command, who uh, wrote all his messages for him. And he was really like a very literate person from like old German nobility, and he always used the same like very lengthy like uh, signature in every message. You know, like yours truly, blah 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 blah, with all his titles at the end. So when they knew that the message has been aimed like, like in the direction like with video frequency interception and everything. Be like, hey, that seems to come from Rumble HQ. Let's just guess that the last 50 characters are this guy's signature because he uses it every time. Um, there's also another thing that they realize. Due to the way the reflector works, a letter can never be encoded to itself. That's, that's, that's obviously because you pass through a reflector and you go back. So once or twice, somebody opened a message that was like, I don't know, 100 characters long and they realized, there's no L in this message, like none at all. It's statistically improbable, unless, unless some guy was asked to send a test message and he was smoking and he was like, I don't want to dump my smoke, but I have to type. What's the letter you can reach on the right side of your keyboard with your, with your hand on a cigarette? That's the L. And he just smashed the L for 100 characters and sent it over as a test. And they're like, I'm going to have a stupid, I have a stupid guess. Like, I think it was uh, Dixie Knoll, uh, one, of the, one of the crackers at, uh, at Hut uh, with, with Tori. Came back and said, I have a stupid hunch. What if this message is just L's, like a hundred of them? And they tried, and it just broke down immediately. They called those words cribs. So cribs were like su supposed plain text that you could try to guess where they were. Uh, if you know exactly what we yes. asked. Yes. The British also could see the weather, then knew what the weather report would be. Yeah, the comment is sometimes they use like a, the, the subs would send the weather report back to Germany for like further planning and stuff like that. But if you knew the weather today, you could interpret how German would, and, 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 uh, and cyber, uh, would write a weather report. Uh, another one that I can't pronounce in German was just no special occurrence today or nothing to report. It's the same message. You send it every day when you have nothing to say. It's the same length. It's the same message. If you get a small message one day, try it out. Maybe you'll get lucky. So basically, they had a bunch of cribs, like supposed suspected plain texts. And then they tried to crack, uh, they tried to basically, they, they configured this. This whole machine was basically plug some suspected text at, at offsets. It will stop if it thinks that it possibly can be there. Is that just. How did they know when to stop? <clears throat> Right, uh, so it's harder to explain here, but what you can do is you can, if, you, if you know a bunch of subsequent letters, you can build what's called a menu, and then from math, you can derive a relationship, between, a mathematical relationship between the letters. So it's a statistical no, it's not a frequency. You, from basically, from, from, the, uh, from the letters of your expected plain text, you can build a bunch of equi like logical relationships between the letters and how they come encoded due to the way the rotor works. And then you just say, if the machine detects a contradiction, it can skip it because obviously it cannot be that. So basically, we formulate, like if you have a 10 letter words and some letters repeat, you know that for the letters to repeat, something has to happen with the wheels and the keys and everything like that. 
And if you detect a contradiction with that, you know that there's a problem and somebody should probably take a look and figure out if it's a possi possible match. It's a bit more complicated to explain, but that's the rough idea. I did not bother trying to implement that because that really works well. Uh, I mean, maybe for a GPU that would work because it's, it, it requires a lot of independent unit trying different things at the same time and figuring out if something works. We're doing a bunch of very sequential processing so that they did not look to me as a good option. Also, the math looked complicated and I'm really bad at math. So, the question is, how do you try where a crib could be in a letter, right, or a message? It's a long message, but remember, a letter can never be encoded to itself. So let's say I have the plain text at the top, and I suspect that they use the word Reichsmarschall somewhere, somewhere, but I don't know where. Do I match any of the letter here? If I do, it can't be that, because a letter cannot be encoded to itself. So for example, this bit, this bit actually decodes through, one of, the, one of those uh, offsets decodes through Reichsmarschall in, in our message. It can be here, but it can be here because there's an A here. So it can't be that. It can't be the hybrid because there's an H here. It could be here, though. It's actually where it is. No, wait, it's that one. It can be here, it can be here, it can be here. It can't be here because there's an R here and there's an R here. So, you know, from there you can basically already cut like almost half and say, those cannot possibly exist. You only have to try to match at those offsets, which, again, reduces the search space. And so for a, for a, for a long enough message, uh, instead of having to try like, a, a four, like 400 uh, potential style offsets, you have to try maybe 200, which already cuts it in half. Always a given. Uh, so yeah, for any rotor order and a key combination, check if any crib at a, a potential location decodes to actually what you expect. And if you do, uh, you try to tweak the ring setting to get something. So basically, I try to match partially, right? Like, I try to decode at every place where Reich Marshall could be there, and if I get like a bunch of letters correct, I'm assuming that I'm there, but probably the rings are wrong, so I just need to tweak them to finish the, the decryption. Uh, it needs to be long enough, because else you get a large number of false positives. Uh, because, you know, if your crib is like five letters long, chances are with some random decode, you might just get one or two letters correct by accident, and you're just wasting your time exploring wrong situations. <laughs> so, what I did is I took my function that I had written for the previous talk, uh, which is just crack settings, which you, know, you take a message, you take the reflector, because I just assumed there's technically two models of reflector, but you know, I, I implemented the support, I just never implemented the second one. Um, you know, early up to, uh, you will, you, you're, not, you're not gonna need it, don't do what I did, just, just out code it for now. And then a span of all the plugs, because again, I wanna try with the plugs first. So I took that and said, okay, I just make like, I'll just template the bunch, uh, the, the heck out of it, I'll take a heuristic, I'll take a score, and I'll, and I'll take a validate. So the heuristic is just, okay, for a, for a given like a combination of rudder positions, uh, ring settings, and key, is it, do you think it's a potential decode? It's supposed to be a cheap function that tells me, is it worth exploring by actually trying to tweak the ring settings to, to get to a partial decode? Then I have a score function that says, okay, what's the actual score? I could have replaced that by uh, a score function and a, and, a, and, a, and a target number. That's basically the same idea. What the heuristic does is check, check the score of that potential decrypt. Does it pass the, uh, does it pass the threshold? If so, uh, that's potentially a match. Try to get it. And then validate is just a, a quick way of saying, OK, is it the right thing? Like, are we done? Right now, what I do is I just look at, is it actually the plain text? I guess if you wanted to turn that into a proper decrypt, you would say, okay, does it match a bunch of like German words that I expect in a text or something like that? But I'm bad at German and I'm bad at like knowing all those keywords. So I just said, ah, just, 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 are you matching the exact text? Yes or no, done. Uh, yeah, and then it's the same signature, but you just take a bunch of functions as a thing and just became a template method. So it was not hard to refactor. And with that, I could basically uplift that function to start trying different type of heuristics to see if maybe I can get something better or something different. And also, that meant that I could have like, I could have a heuristic that is just try to exactly make the message and another one that is just try to match known cribs at certain position. And it would just be the same algorithm. I would avoid like code duplications and things like that. So, if I do some very simple statistics, um, a random decrypt has about one in 26 chance of just getting the right uh, decrypt by accident. It's not actually that, there is some more complex math, but roughly speaking, one in 26 characters might just be there by pure accident because I just rolled the dice and I just got garbage. Two consecutive letters starts becoming harder and three consecutive letters start becoming like way less probable, or at least, less probable enough that it's worth trying to uh, manually tweak the ring settings to see if that's actually correct. 
So what I did is that I just did like, I gave an exponentially higher score for consecutive matches. So like if you get one letter correct, but then the rest around is garbage, you get one point. If you get two, you get four. If you get uh, three, you get nine. If you get four, you get 16, et cetera, et cetera. And usually that means if you get four letter correct, you're guaranteed to pass the heuristic. If you just get like three letters at random in the long message that are not consecutive, it's probably gonna ignore it as a false positive. Uh, I also figured out that I could try more optimizations once I realized that I could lift out the heuristic and the score function. Uh, because right now it's quadratic, right? To try if a given, uh, if a given uh, potential match is right, I had to do 26 times 26 ring settings. And in cases when you start getting a lot of false positives, which the shorter the message in the crib, the larger you get. On the full message, if my, if my crib is the whole message, I get like one false positive before I find the actual results. If my, uh, if my uh, actual candidate is like Reich Markle, or Reich Marshall or something like that, I get a couple millions. So 26 times 26 couple times that starts getting expensive. So I realized that there is a way I can do that. I can just, okay, try to find, to, to guess what's the correct ring settings for the last one, and then pick the best. And that's likely the solution. It's really unlikely that the best scoring for the, for the rightmost setting is not gonna be the best position. Because again, like, and this is the main issue with Enigma that you probably started getting up. Uh, Enigma kind of works like, uh, uh, you know, like those, ah, what's this game? Like a Wardle or like Mastermind if you're older, like me. Uh, you know those games where you, you try a password and they tell you which ones are wrong. You're like, ah, you're getting there. And that's the main issue with a lot of those things, actually. A lot of settings in the Enigma machine, especially the ring settings, they don't give you, like, you know, modern, uh, modern uh, crypto, for example, the property of every good uh, hashing algorithm is that if you change one bit, it changes at least half the bits of the result. This is not the case for Enigma. The closer you get, the less garbled your message is, which is very good if you're trying to implement it as a game or something like that, because, you know, the player can say, oh, I'm getting close. But it's really bad if you're trying to do cryptography. And that's how we can cheat and avoid doing like an actual uh, factorial or, uh, or, 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 uh, or quadratic exploration. We can just say, hey, try all those 26. The best match is likely the best match. And then we just do it, do it again for the second wing and we usually get an almost perfect match. So, <clears throat> um, of course, the compute time is a function of the message length, right? Because the, the, the bulk of the thing when you profile it is just running the Enigma simulation getting the message out and then doing a very bunch of very simple string compare or string count to figure out if this is the, the correct decrypt. But the hardest bit is that we have to go through four, four, four drum table one side and then four drum table on the other side. And there is no way you can predict what's gonna happen. You can't seem that stuff. That's, that's the expensive bit because you have stalls, right? Like on the modern CPUs, it's a bunch of conditions that are waiting for the previous uh, operation to be able to continue. So like you defeat the whole concept of like modern CPUs being able to do a lot of math at the same time because all the data is, uh, is there's the data dependencies between the operations. But that's not the case if you start to do like just some simple heuristic match or stuff like that. You can just compute all, this, all that stuff in one go and then get the result at the end. Like CPUs are smart. So if the message is shorter, your decrypt is kind of, is kind of gonna scale on how fast it does. Uh, so what I figured out is that if you have a very few possible position for a given crib, instead of trying to crack the whole message, start at the first position it can match until the last position it can match, match exactly that. You'll get the wrong settings and you get the wrong key for the whole message. But again, you know the function, right? It just, the rudders have turned a bunch. You just have to reverse the thing, just reverse the keystrokes, make the, make the rudders turns back. And the only thing you might get wrong is that if you got the wrong ring setting, maybe one time you step twice instead of once and that was incorrect. But that's like four trials to get the actual correct answer and you're done. So you just reverse the thing to the, what you suppose is the original setting. Then you just tweak a bit the ring settings in case there was a double step you missed because your message is too short to have registered it. And then you get the actual key. <clears throat> uh, for example, so we suspect that the donut's message has been sent by someone we know. We suspect he's, he's, he's there. We suspect he signed the message. So we're going to look for this, which again looks like garbage, but if you speak German, it means signed right later to Pe Bormann, which Martin Bormann, um, high-ranking Nazi at the time, uh, is the one who signed the message saying this, is, this guy is now in charge as, a, as the secretary, basically. So we suspect that there is this message there. And also there's something we know. It's a signature, right? They're not going to put it at the start. You sign, you sign at the end of the message. So we're just going to assume that it's in, you know, the last the last quarter of the message. 
So that gives us only like 93 characters to look at, the last quarter of the message, and only 12 places due to the, uh, due to the uh, clashing letters thing where it can be. Uh, and I really do with uh, 20 thread on my on my home PC uh, on my on my PC at the office. I also improved a bunch of things, so now it actually logs like the number of false positives you have to go through, and the ETA is a bit better. Uh, and yeah, it it takes about yeah the last log I it logs every five seconds roughly speaking, and in about less than a minute it cracks it and just managed to reverse it correctly to the uh, to the right settings. And all I had to know is that there was probably this form of, uh, of signature in the message somewhere. And I suspected it was at the end. So, yeah, but it's still not ciphertext only, right? We're getting close, but we're not there. We could, if I was not lazy uh, and I had more time, we could basically try to turn this into a ciphertext only attack, because what do ciphertext only attack do in practice? We have a big dictionary of Krebs, like a lot of potential uh, decrypts, and we just try to match them everywhere they can in the message. And if you start matching more than a couple of them, you consider that you're probably on the right way because it's unlikely to be garbage, and then you do some refinement, and then you go there. Um, but I talked about index of coincidence before, and we still have, I don't know, like 25 minutes, so we can probably check a lot real quick. How does that work? Has anybody heard about the index of coincidence? Hey, I didn't either before I did this talk. So that's this. That's good. That's math. I have no idea how that works, but I figured out that it's not too hard to actually compute with a uh, normal code. Uh, it was invented in 1922 by uh, an army cryptographer in the US uh, named William F. Friedman, and it's specially made to crack most uh, like uh, polyalphabetic or monoalphabetic ciphers. And what does it mean? It's basically it's it's. Uh, it gives you like an idea of the frequency of the thing. Like basically it says, uh, I, I can't redo the math in my head, but the idea is, what is the probability that this is random? Given this text, what does the letter distribution look like? Because you know, actual garbage, every letter will be about one in 26 times the same, right? You'll have as many Z as you have A's, as you have E's, because it's random garbage. Again, we had a talk earlier that random is a bit more complex than that, but that's the rough idea. If I have 480 characters, chances are it should close, it should start being close to, the, to, the, to this actual uh, result if I'm just looking at wrong decode, because all the letters will be roughly uh, spread out and it will be garbage. But natural language doesn't do that, obviously. Uh, so a pure uniform distribution has an, has an index coefficient of one, that's the formula. If you have one, it's basically every letter is, uh, is, is, is uniformly distributed. But if you're looking at like English texts, you get 1.73. Uh, German is 2.5, or 0.5. Uh, and if you run it on the plain text of the Dun, especially, you see 1.5. That's a lot more uh, and a very easy way to, 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 to detect like an, a noise to signal ratio, basically. I can really click, quickly ignore anything that is like under 1.2 and say everything else likely to not be garbage. And that is what, that is how early on they decrypted like a pre-Enigma. That's how people crack messages like Visioner Cipher and things like that. Because you're like, try this, what are the other, this is garbage. Or if you get a random cipher, like if you get a, a random text and you don't know what it is, you can run the IC and it will immediately tell you, is this an intelligible garbage or is this basically a garble of a natural language that has just been substituted? And that's basically what we're trying to guess, right? Like, is it basically unsubstitute German or unsubsti like substitute German or whatever? <clears throat> so, again, what we do is we just have to change the match heuristic. Uh, before, what I did is I had a scoring function that tried to count like consecutive matches compared to what I expected to be the right result. Instead of that, I just take my potential decrypt and I just say, okay, compute the index of coincidence, and if it's bigger than arbitrarily 1.2, well, I guess it's fine. Uh, and then we'll see what we do. And if I run it, uh, actually it's 370 characters. And yeah, it takes, I don't know, about, about 80 seconds and it fails. It runs through all the search space and I get nothing. I get garbage. Damn, did they lie to me? <sighs> that's, that's sad. Here's the problem. That's the Donitz message. 
with, uh, with all the right settings if I decrypt it correctly. That's the same one, but I got the middle right wing setting wrong. So, you know, there is a turnout that is incorrect. You see immediately the noise starts popping up, but it's still, I can still tell. Now, if I get both settings wrong on the rings, I get less than one. I cannot tell that from actual garbage. So that completely breaks down. There's a solution, obviously, which is just, just go back, just fuck it, time 26. Just try every ring, uh, right wing setting everywhere, and that way we will work back again. And that way I could technically do a pure like uh, cracking of that message with index of coincidence uh, as long as I get that. There's another problem though uh, that I will explain here. Again, still didn't do the math. Uh, someone very smarter can probably find a better uh, heuristic than what I did. I found a paper from 2017 from uh, two researchers. I'm not sure if they're like academic or if it's just like a hobby. But they made a paper on how to break modern Enigma, uh, and they used a lot of index of coincidence. Especially, they used the index of coincidence to find the first, the, 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 the right ring setting, the right uh, router and key, and also the first few like plugs. And once they have a few plugs, then they switch to like trying to match trigram and bigrams and uh, other like uh, cribs uh, to, to, to try to actually line up to correct, uh, to correct characters to find the last matches. I could not reproduce it. For example, if you take the, uh, the Donitz message I have, you pass it through the thing, but you just have the wrong plug board, your IC is 0 0.99, can't distinguish it from garbage. I have no ID, there was no source provided for their, uh, for their paper, so that's where I left when I started looking at this, when I tried to add some more content for this. If anyone here is an Enigma expert and know what I'm doing wrong, I'm really interested to know. So before we leave, the whole point of this thing was to have fun, right? Like, I wanted to prove a theory, like, can we crack modern, uh, can, we, can we crack like a, a hundred years old, almost like crypto with a, with, a, with a modern PC, or is it still hard? And also like, if I do a pet project in C++, what kind of tech can I end up using? I have no uh, project blocking, nobody's telling me that I have to ship on consoles and they're stuck with that old SDK or whatever. I can do what I want, I'm free. Well, as long as MSVC supports it, because that's what I have, you know, that's already something. So what did I use? Uh, I used a bunch of constexper and constexper algorithm. Uh, especially I, I found the trick about doing the repeating uh, wiring of the routers in an other Enigma simulator that was done in C. And what they had is that in plain text, they had a repeating free time like router wiring and a repeating free time reverse router wiring, which is a lot of code repetition and a lot of chances to get it wrong. What I have in mind is just one time the correct one for the 26 letters, and then with constexper, I just triple it, and then I just reverse the, uh, generate the reverse, and that's just done at compile time, and I avoid any risk of uh, getting that wrong. I could even run a static asset to make sure that every letter has only one mapping, just in case someone made a gobble. Uh, I used a lot of string view and a lot of span. There is barely any string in my thing. The only place that there's string is when you actually try to uh, uh, collect how many keys have matched for those particular settings, then I have to put them in a collection of strings. And since strings are a small buffer, it's not too bad. But a lot of string view, a lot of spans. Uh, parallel algorithms, that I did not bother looking further than just doing par and sec in, in one of the top level loops of my, uh, of my router configuration try. Basically what I did is I generated like a big array of all the possible router orders. And then I just do a parallel for all this combination, find me the one that actually matches a key. And that was it. I, went, I had parallel and I never touched it again. Uh, and then when I made this talk originally, I thought format was in 23, but as it turned out it's in 20, and I have 20 on my MSVC, so I changed all my, uh, my ugly like uh, C outs uh, to use a stud format. And it's a bit nicer. What I considered. Uh, generating a big array of all the router com combination is kind of stupid. Uh, just to do a parallel for on all the options. I thought that maybe I could use some ranges to, uh, to generate like a sequence, but I'm bad at ranges, so I skipped that. Uh, and that, that would have been like a, an extra couple hours. I thought about coroutines too, because technically you could consider that uh, the loop is over a generator that returns a different, like, that returns a different like router combination every time. Uh, but again, every time I watch a talk about Crotin, they say that you have to re-implement your Crotin library first, and I'm like, I have stuff to do. So I skipped that. Uh, and I really wish I had C++23 printLN, 
Because format without print is really stupid because you still have to pipe it into C out. And that just looks ugly. And I just would wish I could just do like stud print and just my, my stud format thing. It's a really simple thing, but I think it would be really great when we have it. Sadly, it's not in MSVC yet. Cool. So uh, to wrap this up before we go to questions. Uh, so Enigma is not a recommended cipher in 2023. That's, uh, that's the first takeaway. It's really simple. You don't even need power to make it run, but someone with power will crack it. Um, still, like, if you have 60-bit cipher, if I try to go dumb brute force on a modern desktop, it was going to take me a while to crack it. It's not impossible, but it's going to take me a long time. Like, you, obviously, yes, uh, an actual government with an actual military intelligence service and a, build, and a server farm will murder that, and that's why you don't use uh, SHA-1 or, like, uh, DES and whatnot today. But... But if you just have a laptop, like, good luck. Uh, and also, a bunch of C++ 17 and 20 features will find their way, uh, even in, like, a very simple, like, pet peeve project that you decided to do for a talk. Um, and that's basically what I had. <clears throat> do you have any questions? <clears throat> Actually, there's a catch. I have one specific question that I hope you're going to ask, uh, because I have a bunch of slides to answer it. You're not going to ask it, because nobody gets it correct, but you get one chance of trying. <laughs> Who wants to go? No pressure. Come on, what is the one question that I did not answer? Have you been listening correctly? There's one bit that has not been answered. It's very important. Go ahead. Why did you write it <clears throat> nice. But it's not about tech. Another one. It's about history. I'll give you a hint. Oh, it just lowers. And I, I don't know about history. Too bad. <clears throat> what? Sorry? What's the what? The message. Yes. I'm, uh, that's just the message I explained, right? It's the, the message that, that names someone uh, in charge of the Reich after, uh, after basically, the message is sent like three days after, after the suicide of Hitler and his friends. So um, basically, they're just this is the last guy we, 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 we have to put in command of the Reich. Uh, you can find the decrypt somewhere if you're interested. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, you mean the teaser we sent? Yeah, we were announcing a DLC like a year ago. Uh, it's uh, it, it's called uh, what is it called? Damn, I forgot. Uh, by Blood Alone. It's about it's about Italy and uh, and uh, and Ethiopia. If you play Out of Iron, you might be interested. It's been in sale for like nine months now, but hey, go and buy it. But that's not the question I had in mind. One question remained, and I guess you haven't been paying attention. What happened to Radievsky and the Polish Cipher Bureau? That might look like something that you don't think about, but who of you have heard about Rajevsky before I did this talk? Who have thought that, you know, Enigma was crack at Bletchley, like, from the get-go? Because that's what I heard in school. I don't know about you. What do you like, did you know about Rajevsky? If you're Polish, you're cheating, so please don't raise your hand. But, uh, <clears throat> okay, cool. So if you looked at what I said earlier, um, you know, they shared their fighting with France and England in July 39. And, you know, the I spent a lot of effort bringing, like, uh, Enigma, and, you know, that was, that was difficult. They had to use, like, all the resources they can. You know, the same way when they worked on the nuclear bomb. They took, like, all the great mind they could get from every expat. Like, there's a reason why so many German refugees and Polish refugees and a bunch of other refugees worked on the Manhattan Project. Same reason, right? You're going to win this war. You have very bright people who have made original work on it. Why would you not use them? And as if you noticed, Rajewski died in 1980. So it's not like he died in the war. So what happened? Why have we never heard about him? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so it's 1939. Uh, the Germans are up to no good. Uh, they have already shown that they're up to no good with Austria, uh, Czechoslovakia, and uh, a few other places. And the writing is on the wall, right? The German, like, Rajewski is in Warsaw with the rest of the Cypher Bureau, but they know what's happening. Uh, the Germans have been massing troops. And on September 1st, 1939, they uh, stage a full flag operation, say that the Poles attack first, and they just break the, the border with like 100 divisions. 
and Poland doesn't stand a chance. Uh, and on top of that, they have a secret agreement with the Soviet Union, which is about to attack the next, uh, the next month on the pretext of helping the Poles uh, uh, stabilize the country. Basically, they have a deal to partition Poland, which is sadly a thing that had repeated itself in history. But they know what's happening, right? So they try to evacuate Wojcicki, uh, and the closest thing they can do, uh, they can't really go to the Baltics because they don't really trust those people who have been satellites by, uh, by the USSR. They can't go to Slovakia because it's a German puppet. And Hungary is making a lot of overtures with, uh, with uh, Michel Sorti and his uh, regime to Hitler. So they don't, sell it, they don't see it good and they don't really trust boats. So he runs to the, uh, to the Romanian border, which is technically neutral at the time, but trying to make more and more overtures to, uh, to, uh, to the Germany because they just... Uh, they're about to have their, uh, their, their, their king over, overthrown by, uh, by a Nazi supporter named, uh, named Antonescu. So they run to the, Polish, uh, to, the, to the Romanian border. There's a lot of refugees already because people are fleeing Poland in the war. And they manage, in the midst of the chaos, to go through. They almost get recognized. And they know that people stop them at the border. Like, well, you were like, we're, we're, we're Polish scientists. And they get arrested. And they're really afraid for a moment that the, what the Romanian police will do is just turn them to the German because they're trying to make good relations with Germany. Luckily, there's so many refugees that they manage to sleep away into the night while people are checking everybody's paper. They throw away their papers, they change some cash, they book a bunch of tickets, and they take a train to Budapest, uh, to Bucharest, sorry. I keep confusing the two. They manage to reach Bucharest about 24 hours later after a long train ride. They come exhausted to the British embassy, and they, hey, they knock at the door, hi. We cracked Enigma, can we get in? And the Brits are like, sorry, old chap, never heard of an Enigma. And they turn them away. They start panicking a bit, because it's late at night, and the police is looking for them. They run to the French embassy. And the French are like, I have never heard of an Enigma, but let me call Paris. Come back in an hour. They call Paris, Paris is like, yes, let them in. They manage to get inside, and through arrangement through French diplomatic passports, they get sent to Paris. When they start working with the French, because obviously France is not at war with Germany as, the, as well as England, and France has its own decrypting bureau in Paris called PC Bruno, and they start doing more things. They will actually meet uh, Alan Turing at the time, who flies from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the UK to try to discuss what they're working on. And they work on it for about a year. Uh, and they help them read basically all the German transcripts uh, for basically the phony war from 39 to 40. Uh, they will actually warn the French higher ups that uh, they're about to invade Norway, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France, but they get ignored because you know, French high command in the 1940s is not our finest hour. Uh, so, but still, they continue working. Uh, actually, at the time, the Allies were experimenting with a new rotating cipher system. And they say, hey, can you take a look at this thing? And I think they came back 12 hours later and say, hey, yeah, we cracked it. Find something better. <laughs> so pretty smart people, right? But again, everybody who knows anything about history know that France has lost World War II very badly early on. And so that's what happens, right? The German attack through Belgium, and it's a fucking disaster. <clears throat> uh, and the French army is quickly put uh, in, a, in, in a state of a rout and starts looking at suing for peace. But again, Wojcicki and, uh, and, and, the, and the cryptographers manage to run away because uh, the French really don't want them to be uh, captured by the, by the Germans. So they send them away to the south and they burn down anything that they can't transport. Uh, and they manage to reach the French colony, well, colony or territories of, uh, of Algeria back in the day, which was where the French government had planned to evacuate uh, should they get, uh, <clears throat> should, the, sh should, should the government fall. Uh, funny, funny story, uh, the German will capture whoever was still remaining at PC Bruno. They will torture about five or ten people. None of them will ever reveal that they actually had a bunch of people who had cracked Enigma there. They will still be in the blind. So after uh, French use for peace and turned into Vichy France, uh, the scientists are actually sent back to southern France, but they start working on a secret uh, unit with the French resistance on still decrypting more stuff uh, in southern France for like a couple years, uh, basically 1941, 1942, until the Allies invade uh, North Africa and Germany starts panicking that France might turn again against them. So they invade the rest of France and Wojcicki has to run away again. He runs to the Spanish border this time, and he pays a guy, a local, to cross him across the Pyrenees to get into neutral Spain. Spain is kind of fascist, but technically neutral. Uh, the, um, the guy betrays them, 
he uh, robs them of their clothes and their money and sends them to cross the Pyrenees by foot on themselves. They still manage to do it, but they get arrested on the next side of the border and get sent to jail in Spain. Luckily, the Polish Red Cross intercedes to Franco and say, come on, those are just scientists. Why are you keeping scientists in jail? Franco doesn't really see the point. He doesn't know about Enigma. And after a year or so of tribulation, they manage to get them released. They go to Portugal. And from Portugal, they finally manage to get a visa to go to England. And they actually tried to get into Bletchley. But by that time, it's 1943, and uh, all of Bletchley Park is national security, and they do not want any foreign national, especially one that has been in uh, Vichy France for a couple of years, to know anything about it. So they refuse to let him see Turing, they refuse to let him work on Enigma, they tell him, hey, uh, there's some minor ciphers we've heard about, maybe you want to take a look at it, which I guess was like the equivalent of Sudoku for him. He probably got very bored. And so until the end of the war, he will never team back up with uh, with, uh, with Turing, and he will actually go back to Poland after the war and refuse to talk about it because the Soviets, sadly, after World War II, annexed Poland, and he knows that if they learn that they have a cryptographer that was good enough to break German ciphers, he's going to end up in a KGB camp for the rest of his life. And he doesn't really want that. So he says nothing until basically the Eastern Bloc starts collapsing and he feels like nobody cares anymore about Enigma, and he starts talking about what he did in his life in the 70s. But what if? What if the Brits were less stupid and let him work with, uh, with this guy? I mean, he cracked Enigma with a bunch of paper, and the man he worked with went on to invent the first computer. What if he had this guy to help him? What if, like, you know, they would have made cons the default? <laughs> what if we had no such thing as, like, ill form, no diagnostic required, whatever the hell that means? Hey, we could even have coroutines in the 90s and library support, which we still don't have. Right? You know, like people are like, oh no, my health history is like some bullshit about World War I. Nah, 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 that's my kink. Like, we just keep turning, uh, teaming up with uh, Turing at Bletchley Park. Right, so uh, if any of that thing uh, has amused you, uh, if you like tech and health history, uh, we are hiring. And there's basically like 200 of us working in Stockholm. So if anyone is interesting, we have some jobs. Feel free to apply. And furthermore, I think your bill should be destroyed. Thank you.